think um, it, it was never really a conscious thing that happened. Um, we created Niaz, we both had previous bands before Niaz, and when we decided to do a project together, we knew kind of what we wanted to do. We knew we wanted to do something that was very modern, but at the same time rooted in culture and tradition. Um, so that was why we, you know, the, that was the original concept of, uh, of Niaz, is to create a platform to be able to um, perform a lot of old poetry, old folk songs, but in a very new way so that it would be relevant to us. So we had several goals. One was to tell the story of our generation of Iranian Americans who came. It was a different time um, because our parents were already either in their late 30s or early 40s. So we had already lived a part of our life in Iran and then we came here and then we were kind of caught between two cultures the Iranian culture that we already had a strong connection with and then now with the American culture. So how were we going to reconcile these two very opposing um, forces, you know, uh, cultural forces? So partially the music also was about uh, being able to reconcile something for ourselves and tell our story. And also to create something that we felt was relevant to the rest of our generation because um, for me personally, as a lover of music, I just felt that in Iranian culture we had um, our classical music and then we had our very, very pop music and there was really not so much in the middle of that spectrum, so it was either this or that and I, I didn't relate to either, um, so it was, um, also that was another uh, motivation for me personally. Um, to create, to be able to fill this spectrum in between. And now there are a lot more Iranian-American artists um, who are, are filling that spectrum, but when we started, that didn't happen. Um, and then at the end, I think when we launched the project, the thing we never expected to happen, which happened, is that majority of our audience ended up becoming Americans or Europeans, or it just kind of took off everywhere but we had a hard time actually winning over Iranian audiences, which we thought there are, there's a whole generation who's like us, but they don't get what we're doing. And then, you know, we just continued. And eventually, I think the ones who are getting it and who get what we do, they are a lot like us. They are people who are, I, I would like to say, more open to other kinds of music and music of other cultures. They're not so... Um, just focused on whether or not it represents Iranian culture, and that's why I should like it. I see. So, so um, can I? Yeah, I want to add it just here. Yeah. I think the the key success is that as a immigrant artist or as a artist in diaspora, there comes a point that you have to celebrate an identity that it is bigger than your national identity. Once you reach that point, you realize that no longer you can have a specific target audience of uh, ethnicity. You cannot say, oh, you know what, I'm writing this song because Iranian would love it. Because you're no longer competing with just one uh, group or one country. You're, now you're in a market that uh, a Greek artist is doing something that is putting out there, an Italian artist is putting something out there. So now you have to rise above it and recognize that you, you're, uh, you're just a citizen of the world and you have to look at it as a whole, no longer as these small parts. I think the, the, the problem is that because of the trauma of the revolution and we have 
there is the this sense that uh, spirituality is being perceived as being religious, which totally have nothing to do with each other. Actually, our biggest contribution from that region is not just inclusive to Iran. Asian cultures and societies' biggest contribution to humanity is their philosophy, is their poetry, it's the perception of life. But because of what we have gone through, now anything that looks a little bit, has a little bit of a spiritual context to it, immediately for Iranians, it translates as being religious. And right now, there is a huge resistance toward that. And that kind of repulsed them. So it's not really embracing the, the essence of it, or what it is that they'd be trying to relay. No, I, 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 I absolutely agree with that. I think that um, the, the other reason is also, um, you know, I'm, I'm very open about, about this, you know, and I know that a lot of Iranians, they don't like when I say this, but I'm not a nationalist in any way. You know, I don't believe in flags and uh, nationalist or religious identities, you know, because I, for me, humanity should come first. And um, it does not mean that I'm not proud to be Iranian, but I am not proud because I am Iranian. I'm just proud because of the human, you have to be proud of the human being that you are. And coming from Iran, I think one of the, very important issues that we like to address through our music is that you know there is no single Persian identity because what makes Iran Iran is all the minorities that are there you know we can go down the list from the Azeris to the Turkaman to the Baloch to the you know look at just how big Iran is and all the minorities that we have all the religions that we have all of these are what creates an, an entire Iranian identity. So unfortunately, I feel that uh, there's a very specific kind of Iranian identity that has been um, solidified in our psyche from the moment that we are born in Iran. And uh, I, for one, never related to that. I felt that it didn't apply to me. So um, especially having grown up in India and then moving to America when I was 15, I became a citizen of the world and I, I became much more aware of the racism within my own country, within my own geographical borders and I think that's addressing that in art is a very powerful thing. So I think that nationalist aspect, because we are not constantly promoting a very particular sense of what it is to have a Persian identity, can also be um, a point that is not attractive for Iranians because Iranians they want to go see or hear something and be able to say this is Iranian I'm proud to be Iranian you know but we don't do that okay um, I'm gonna follow up with that's two it questions. everyone is gonna delete this, <laughs> this <laughs> no this is great I, I want I love these answers this is where you get all the hate <laughs> mail why the hell did you interview no, these no, like, artists I really believe you like, can leave this part in there I don't mind I believe I agree with everything you said yeah and they and, have to be said you and know? that's yeah. the thing they it's not being said we, we, but we have yeah. we're saying it we're saying it do you to want those me to want follow up on that a little I think we should be very honest because want, I want to follow up on that sure. or something okay. actually if you look at the history of our region whether it's Turkey the, the Palestine, you look at Iran, you could look at India, there was no nation. There were empires. You had Ottoman Empire, you had the Safavid empires. And what did they do? They actually let the minorities live on their own. They collected taxes from, as a central government. But the, co the concept of nationalism is actually a very colonial idea. It came from the West in order to be able to divide and conquer. So they created a sense of nationalism for these small ethnicities in order to be able to divide them and control them. And then what did they do? They actually made it correlated with uh, feminism, it became a motherland. So this sense of a nationalism actually is very new to us, into our psyche. And the way we actually is trying to process and find it in the modern world, sometimes it's misled. Actually, the and perfect example of it was Shah. He totally misled that sense of nationalism that was created. What did he do? He correlated with what we had created 2,500 years ago. That was it's just it's a ruin. 
okay, it is part of our heritage, but it doesn't identify us. This is not our identity. Our identity is what we are contributing today to the world. That's, that's the core of our identity. <laughs> really something that you're passionate about no, but I you're also to... passionate about it no, th this is something that actually I always said because I noticed it every time I performed in the Middle East as well it's not a problem that I felt was unique to just Iran you know in the Middle East or anywhere we travel even when we go to Asia one thing I noticed is that in general um, people feel feel confused about what it means to modernize. We all are raised with this belief that in order to modernize we have to westernize. And um, that's another big motivation of why we created the style of music we created is because we wanted to show that it is possible to create something very modern and relative to our time, but still is not a westernized music. You know? so many different kinds of music. My favorite music, I mean, I have a lot of different kind of music I like from Western music to non-Western music. But in terms of the Eastern music that I love, um, I grew up always listening to, you know, my mother loved music. She played, a lo my mother loved folk music. So that's really where my love for folk music came from. My mother was obsessed with Sima Bina. So I kind of always had this love for folk, folk music. And then I, moved to India and got familiar with folk music there and then as I became when I became a teenager I started just collecting and listening to folk music from everywhere particularly from Turkey and uh, the songs that we perform are coming from a very specific tradition of the Alevis the Alevi Bektashi uh, tradition in uh, Turkey and they are also a minority group and um, maybe they would be considered equal to the um, Sufis to several Sufi sects in Iran and their music is really beautiful and what I love about their music is it's very spiritual in nature at the same time you know it's it's uh, the poetry is based on very deep concepts and philosophies and the music itself is designed to create a sense of a higher consciousness so I fell in love with Alevi music and then ended up meeting friends in Turkey because we our music ended up becoming really popular in Turkey so we started going there to perform every year and then I started meeting people musicians and then um, discovering these songs these old songs and then my friends would help me uh, to learn to pronounce the poetry correctly and then we would sit and we would create uh, our own compositions around them so we would blend Persian melodies with these Turkish songs. Now to that, but should I wait? Yeah, should I wait for that to go? He ran away. Yeah, <laughs> Actually, um, Azan has two remarkable talents. One is that she can sing songs in different languages and people think she's actually knows the language. She's, uh, she's really good at that. And that, of course, you know, it helps, creates the confidence for us to perform a song that is not Iranian, is not Farsi, and we know, yes, we are actually doing justice to it, because it's very important. And second is that she's really great at listening to archival piece of music and say, oh my God, we can, you know, put this in a contemporary context, and I can sing it, and, you know, we can arrange this, it works. And that's actually also a very remarkable thing. Well, you know, for, for it's 
it's such a personal thing, but you know, for me, art in, in, in the art world, you know, if you're gonna look at everything from paintings to literature to mu music, is the most esoteric of all the arts. You know, it's not tangible in the sense that you can't touch it, you can't see it, you can't. It's something that just goes directly through you. It just just goes. It's about a higher communication for me. It it connects you to something that. Um, you cannot even put into words and this is why we all are desperate for music in our lives nobody can live without music it is it's for me as essential to the soul as water is to life on earth um, so if you think about music in that sense as opposed to you know a lot of people just they listen to there's different levels of music there's music that I like to put on when I'm cleaning the house and I just want energy and I want to dance and have a good time at a party or and then there's music where that I, that makes me go it takes me somewhere and it makes me feel things that I need to feel to make life bearable you know so it's a, for me a question of also high art versus um, I don't like calling it low art but there is something about a sort of higher state of art and uh, when you get into that level of creating music it becomes very universal. It no longer as truly is for me about the lyrics because for me growing up, when I moved to India, let's say, and I, I would listen to some music there, I didn't understand a word of what, was, what they were singing about, but it made me feel something really powerful. And it's at that very young age that I discovered the power that music that can have. That if I don't understand, I think I discovered it at five or six years old, that if, if something that I don't understand can make me feel like this, and I can do that to, to make others feel like that. So when I write songs, I aim for something like that. I aim, I, I am utilizing a language, I am utilizing uh, traditional elements, but at the same time, my ultimate goal is that when I deliver it, it should transcend all those uh, boundaries that exist within language and uh, culture. <laughs> I think, uh, of course, musically, um, uh, Ali Zadeh was very influential, Lotfi was very influence influential for me. Um, Meshkatian, as a composer, was extremely uh, influential for me from the region. But also a series of movies, I think, um, Gavas Hopos G. These these are the films that were made during the 70s that it really had a psychic impact from that region. That the the, the silence and the motion between them really were very provocative and left me with something very visual images, you know, that were very influential influential on forming my artistic uh, sensibilities. For me, well, if I had to say from Iran, uh, I would say Sima Bina, Hossein Ali Zadeh, and uh, what else can I say? Who else was very influential for me? Um, a lot of uh, Haide, Haide played in my house all the time, and uh, a lot of Kurdish artists actually, a lot of Kurdish mm -hmm. music also had a deep impact on me. Well, I think it's interesting because uh, Ramin has been with me several times. Uh, I think it would be interesting to get his perspective on the Iranians there because I lived there for 11 years. So for me, it's a, um, I don't know if I can be completely subjective, but actually I knew very few Parsis. Even though I grew up in a region that was originally um, inhabited predominantly by Parsis. They came there in the early 50s, late 40s, early 50s. But now most of the Parsi families are gone. A lot of the families who came after that were the Baha'is who migrated. Okay. And so a lot of the Iranians that I knew mostly or I know mostly 
who are living there right now are Baha'i Iranians and they are now, they have, have children, so they're second, third generation Iranians and you would never know it. You look at them and even the color of their skin is dark and then they start speaking Farsi too and you're almost shocked because you just, you can't believe it. But you know, you go to their house to eat and their food, like, they make spicy gourmet sabzi, you know? wow. <laughs> You're like, it should taste like gourmet sabzi, but there's something going on, you know? So it's they, even their food has become this fusion of of cultures, you know? It's it's very unusual. I mean, I don't know what your experience no, is true. of Iranians I mean, in India. You know, as you know, you know, every language that you speak kind of it shapes different part of your facial muscles. So depending on the language you speak, your face slightly looks different. And, and therefore, when you immediately see them, you don't recognize that they're Iranian. And then, as she said, you know, they speak Farsi and then you suddenly realize, oh, wow, you know, because they're pretty not, I mean, their, their first language is Hindi, you know, they, they grow up there and that's, that's who they are. But they have really maintained that Persian aspect of their culture. Like you go into their homes and it looks very Iranian, you know, mm. they're so Iranian from the fabrics that they have. Well, there are not or... that many of them. No, so not that many. So it's very hard to gauge because here we are, you know, over, I mean, according actually to census, we are much lower than it's, you know, it's, there is like around, around 300,000 are registered, but, uh, you know, we all believe that we are at least over a million. <laughs> I think to me is first having an understanding of the country that you live in. You know, it, it has to be a little bit of a of a conscious uh, awareness. You know, okay, you know, I'm, I never will be American. I would never hundred percent understand it. But by living in a country, you accumulate a certain experiences that are native to that land. And that begins to become a part of your habits, and the habits shape your identity. You know, it was very interesting last night with one of our musicians. We went, we did a drive-through. We were on the road. We decided to just go to Taco Bell and do a drive-through. He had never done it, and to him, said, "Wow, this is such a weird way to kind of order food." You know that, but you grow up here, this, this becomes secondary, you know, and you kind of don't even think about it. So a lot of little behaviors that are suggested or you are influenced by, also media, school that you go to, this begin to form your habits and habits shape your perception and your perception becomes your identity. Well, aside from the fact that now everyone knows we ate at Taco Bell. <laughs> There is nothing wrong with that. No. You, you can leave that on there. I'm not embarrassed about it. This is the, the unglamorous side of being a touring musician. No, it's okay to have some real moments. No, but in seriousness, I, I, I could never presume to, to, to say what it means for others to be an Iranian American because I look at my own son. He's 10 years old now. He speaks Farsi. He knows a lot of the traditional things that we do at home. But he, he has no concept of really what it is to be an Iranian. Because to say that I know what it is to be Iranian means that I have had a certain lived experience in that culture. So there are a lot of Iranians who have been born here or they were brought here like at five or six and they, they never had that lived experience. So really their knowledge, their experience of being Iranian is limited to sort of home and maybe cultural events or friends and extended family. And then there's the American aspect. So for people like us who we left, um, I mean, I left a lot sooner, but I was traveling back and forth uh, to Iran until the age of eight. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I lived enough in Iran to be able to say I, I have understanding of Iranian culture. But uh, then I lived 11 years in India and then now here. So for me, it's a, I never think about it as a, myself as when, when somebody says you, you're Iranian American, it always feels like it limiting in that sense. If they said you're schizophrenic, it would feel more comfortable <laughs> to me. 
<laughs> because I have no, I, there's such a sense of I'll being, put that on the huh? Side. No, <laughs> schizophrenia is that a is, is that a cultural <laughs> identity? <laughs> you know, I usually just put other because you know it's not enough for me to say I'm Iranian, Indian, American. You know, because I'm never Iranian enough for Iranians. I'm not Indian enough for Indians. I'm not American for Americans. So for me to come and say I'm all these things. You know, it's so in many ways, I think I'm searching for my identity in my art. You know, I think that the music is the place that I feel is the only place I have roots there. That's kind of the destiny of being an immigrant is you, you really will never know roots. And I don't say that as a form of a tragedy. For me, it's a, it's such a realistic sentiment that I can't put a label on myself that I'm this. You know. Well, uh, each of our albums, we um, it's a combination of folk songs, traditional folk songs that we have, uh, um, and it's not just from Iran, but from different regions in the Persian Gulf, along with uh, poetry, uh, Sufi poetry. And each time we have focused on one poet. So our first album was on Moulana, our second we did it on um, Amir Khosrow, uh, Dehlavi, who's, uh, who's actually originally Iranian but went to India and became more popular in India and his poetry is really beautiful. And then our third one, our fourth album was on Rabi al-Basri, the first female Sufi poet. Uh, but the third album, we called it Sumud because on that one we didn't actually dedicate it to any poet and we actually wrote that album based on the concept of Sumud which is a an Arabic word, and it's uh, actually a very powerful ideology that uh, emerged in Palestine. Um, it's a nonviolent resistance, and it's very similar to the uh, nonviolent resistance that Mahatma Gandhi practiced in India. And uh, this actually came from uh, from Palestinians who believe that violence is never going to be the answer to. Uh, it's not going to bring the solution for peace in the Middle East. And there are um, growing amounts of people, and it was created in the 50s, uh, I want to say in the late 50s. So it's actually a long, uh, it's, it's been there for a while. And uh, it's something nobody ever talks about or attributes to Palestinians because it's uh, so, they're, they're always thought of as just all of them in general are terrorists. But the reason why it relates to us and why we would take that, let's say, as Iranians and doing... Um, first of all, on that album, we recorded with a Christian Palestinian musician who was also touring a lot with us. So we felt that we, his story needs to be woven into our story because we, we all share that. And second of all, I thought it was really beautiful that this kind of a nonviolent philosophy uh, exists in the Middle East but is not being promoted and, and practiced even more. So part of that was our way of kind of showing something positive that is happening. Um, unfortunately, I don't think it had any impact, you know. The few people who know what Sumud means or know what it is were really appreciated that we tried to present something different. Um, but it didn't have the impact that we wanted, and which is fine, you know. It was a work of art we created for that time, and. Um, and we still stand by it and really believe in that philosophy. For Niaz or personally, because they're, they're not always the same in many ways, because Niaz is collective. Okay. Uh, and that kind of creates a sense of divergence. It's a bigger. It's a, it's a bigger project and you know it, it leads a certain aspect of us which it's not inclusive of all of the expressions that we like to make as a individual artists so to answer for Niaz I think we had we came to a point that we realized that the, in order to have a the impact that we want Niaz to have is that we have to move toward multimedia that it has to come to a point that it, it kind of begins to utilize a digital scenography and we realize 
this is the way that people will continue and we can communicate with the audience. Uh, the time that um, in this genre, particular genre of music, uh, people will go to just listen to a single solo, you know, here and there, in that th those days are gone. People don't have that sense of passion. If they want to do that, they do it on YouTube. They, in order for them to go and try to experience something live, it has to be by far more stimulating. And even for us, in order to express ourselves as a project NEOS, we felt it is time to be, to make it, to enhance it more, to make it bigger. So our impact is to make it, to say something new in a multidisciplinary form. For me, I think uh, there's the personal goal, which is, um, as I said, I think uh, a lot of it is just self-discovery and exploration. And uh, the other aspect of it, I think there it's twofold. One is that um, I think the two biggest um, fears in the world right now are globalization and fear of technology. I mean, both of these are things that have very negative as well as positive aspects. And I think within NIAS, for me, is a perfect platform to celebrate the positive aspects of globalization mm -hmm. as well as uh, technology. So that, that really intrigues me. You know, on the, right now for this multimedia show, all of us on the project, you know, on the stage, we are from Iran, from Tunisia, from Montreal, from Turkey, from India, and um, from, from France. So it's kind of, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing that we, we are from such different places, but we come together and we, we are creating something that makes perfect sense. We have found a language that we all speak, and there's, there's absolutely no point when I am with them that I feel I'm different from them culturally. There is, it, it's, it's a really powerful experience to have that. So, so for me, that and that's uh, an aspect of Niaz that I would love to continue to, to develop and explore even more and more. How far we can go with that? You know? Okay. Um. And include uh, and include others. You know, I I I've, I say this over and over again. Um, what I'm most proud about in my career, you know, is not that I've toured the world or I've done how many X amount of CDs. What for me is the most source of pride is when I get on a stage and I look out at the audience and I see people of all cultures, background, like, you know, ages and it's in terms of even professions, what people do, it's across the board. And I feel that, you know, we have cre managed to create something that really has cre it has created a bridge where so many people are able to come on this bridge and feel that they have a place on it and they belong there. I mean, to, I think for any artist, they couldn't be a higher, uh, they could be no more noble uh, goal or dream, you know, than, than this, to create something that is so unifying. Collaboration. Well, I, I love it. I mean, I think. Are you specifically talking about Iranian artists? Because um, it's mostly just in general. Because in general, in it's general mostly artists. Iranian artists. Yeah. Who are like that. Yeah. 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 The young generation of Iranians, you know, it's and there are conversations we avoid having at all costs. Sometimes we'll have them when we are gathered around the table and we are relaxed, but it's something we are never proud to talk about in public. It's sort of when some somebody says something bad about your mother and you get angry, and you f and but then you yourself are okay with saying the same bad thing about your mother. I think we are all. So that aspect is very strong in, in the Persian identity, not just for Iranians, for I think for a lot of cultures. But I think that we, it, we have to try and change the psychology 
uh, a lot, you know, in within our culture because there is, uh, we have faced in our career, you know, doing this now for so many years, uh, some of our biggest obstacles were because of other Iranians, you know, uh, of not having the support or people, you know, deliberately trying to um, derail us in some way or another. For that part, we have had just as many Iranians who were supportive and helped us. But I think that uh, in order to really move forward as a culture, to really be able to go to the next level in terms of just a collective, we, we have to get over this paranoia and fear that there is only room for one or two people. You know, there is room for everyone and everyone's ideas. You know, you never look at a tree and say, wow, you know, that leaf is taking the place of that leaf. And if that leaf was not here, this tree would be so much more beautiful. And the world of art is the same way. You know, there's room for everybody, but it's very strong in our culture as we grow up that there's not room for everybody else, you know. So there's a paranoia and people are not willing to work together as much. And we are really trying to change that and encourage that. So one thing we love to do is take younger artists like under our wing or if they want help with something, we always try to help them because it's, you, you, it's about changing also the psychology. Yeah, but collaboration means building something that is bigger than you. You know, I think if you're going at it from that angle, then it's, you know, it's a remarkable thing. If it is trying to create just you know get more attention then that's a different thing you know that's a more of a marketing uh, idea but in terms of the actual creation there's nothing better than collaboration really she and i collaborate all the time in neos and you know we collaborate all the time but it doesn't uh, happen Turkish, as much with iranian no. artists because we find iranians are less uh, then you get into the issue of who you know those issues that we can't relate to which is you know how big my name should be on the flyer or you know what's my position gonna if you get into a, a battle of egos that in this context never works because for us the, even though him uh, ramin and i are the fundamental you know we are the mother and father of niaz you know ev when we gather with the team and the musicians, it becomes such a, de it's, it's, we are a council, we, it becomes so democratic and everybody has an equal voice. So anyone who's going to come to that table has to accept that. That, you know, when I come to this, I'm going to be equal with these people. I'm not going to be better, I'm not going to be less, but if I'm here, it has to be equal. And um, it's much harder for us with other Iranian artists. And then also it's a matter of taste because a lot of the contemporary Iranian artists out there, they are not really doing what we are doing. We're in such a different world. I mean, a lot of, as you can hear, a lot of it is still, for me, too much uh, influenced by Western music, whether it's jazz or, um, you know, the singers, American singer-songwriters. And those are elements that are, are too Western for me. And I love those that music, but if I want to listen to that music, there are incredible Western artists whose work I really enjoy and I'll just go listen to that. But to hear it from an Iranian, I can't relate to that. So so a matter. it's also a matter of finding other Iranian artists that I feel um, we can relate to or their, their color has a place in this painting that we are creating, you know. I don't know if you, you, you no, should No, I don't want to add also. anything, but I want to go back to something at the very end because I felt I want Okay. On a totally different subject. Sure. Yeah. Well, I would say first you have to know your music. And then you have to know your language. That means the way you want to express it. These are very esoteric, very philosophical. And so I know, it's, you know everybody can think about it differently. But... Really try to internalize those elements that you are trying to utilize. Like if you really learn a melody or you listen to a melody that you like, you have to so internalize that melody that it begins to shape your accent, your melodical accent. It becomes part of you. 
So it, then you begin to have a, a very unique individual voice. But otherwise, if you just hear something, you get excited and you decided to take that and now put it in something else. This is just like making a soup that has just like too much spices in it and at the end it's not eatable. Really choose your elements wisely and choose them and learn them. And then in terms of the commercial aspect of your career, create content. Those days of trying to get a label deal and trying to be, uh, you know, being signed and somebody else is going to be taking care of it, it's never going to happen. Today's, and that's universal for any artist out there, you have to be a good administrator, you have to be a good um, about uh, promotion, you have to be very good uh, about generating content, just generate. The advice I give artists, and it, it doesn't matter what genre of music you want to do, I think the main thing is that you have to be very clear about your vision. You know, the you can be a great musician at your instrument, but if you don't have a clear vision about what it is that you want to create, um, it's going to show in your work. So you have to be very clear and you have to be really honest, because once you're clear about what you want to do, it's easier to become honest. You know, now I meet a lot of people when we perform, yes, uh, young Iranians will come to me and say, you know, I love it. I also want to try to incorporate electronic music in like the folk stuff I'm doing. And I say, that's great. So what kind of electronic music do you listen to? And they say, well, I don't really listen. And I say, how can you incorporate something that you don't listen to? You know, I mean, we didn't sit and say, we want to put electronic music on Niaz. The thing is, I was growing up with electronic music, and electronic music means techno music, house music, trip-hop music, ambient music, there's so many different kinds. So you have to know, to break your boundaries, you have to know your boundaries. So you have to listen to different kinds of music. I encourage, especially Iranians, listen to as many different styles of music as you can, because when you, when you listen to that, it develops your, first of all, it, it really gives you an idea of uh, the level that you can create. But when you listen to different kinds of music, it, it really does something to you. And when you come to compose, suddenly you'll find aspects of the different things you have heard coming into you and it makes your language refined. You know? so, so that's the first advice I give people. Listen to different kinds of music, expose yourself. Even if you're gonna come back and just do your folk music or your jazz album, listen to different kinds of music, you know. Actually, I was, um, my first instrument was violin when I was in Iran. And then I was about 14 years old when I came to the United States and I ended up in Eugene, Oregon. So there, my accessibility to kind of being able to continue learning classical Iranian music on, on violin was next to zero. So I learned, I picked up a guitar. All the time I wanted to play Iranian phrases on guitar. And the closest thing that I came up with ever was flamenco music. So there was a period that I was obsessed with flamenco music and tried to learn that. And then I had a teacher who um, was a fantastic flamenco player uh, from Spain, living in Los Angeles. By then I had moved to LA. Um, he would, no matter how much I would practice, he would always, as soon as I would play, he would say, yeah, that's great. So next lesson. And I was like, wait, <laughs> you don't know how much I wore before I came here. And then one day I asked him, so, okay, you have to be honest with me, what's going on? And he said, you want the truth? You have an accent in your phrases and you will never get rid of that accent. If, if you want to get rid of it, you have to learn Spanish, you have to move to Spain, you have to be the fifth guitarist that is just playing Resquiado at the end of the line and learn that, and every time you're kind of getting ahead of the beat, all of them are going to give you a dirty look. You have to see the, the, the singer get drunk all that is going to become part of your accent. Without that, you're always going to be a third class guitarist. So I quit. Actually, that was the best <laughs> advice he gave me. And I tried to create an instrument that 
was mine and the first one was a quarter tone guitar which I used in Axiom of Choice that was my first invention or trying to modification of an instrument that became my language and that was and from there I had a journey always an obsession about to cry trying different instruments that I can expand my vocabulary and use them and then you look at it as a composer okay where is the frequencies that are lacking that I can come up with something that is gonna help there and of course in our music the, the lower frequency the baritone is very weak and bass and baritone so basically I wanted a bowed instrument and therefore with the, with the help of uh, Jonathan Wilson who's a genius man that came up with the idea of the revi revise, uh, revitalizing the, uh, the bowed guitar Arpeggioni, he created Come On For Me and that has become my main voice now. And that, that instrument is, uh, is a cello, it's almost like a cello and it's quarter toned, so it's electric, so I can process it, it's westernized, it's easternized, it has all the palettes and colors that I personally need. It's Romanized. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. But that's really, I know I give you a very long answer, but it's, it's, there's a, there was an arch to it of why I wanted to make an instrument. It wasn't that, oh, it's fashionable, oh my God, I want to, you know, how does it, yeah. it's, it's, it was necess it was part of the, it was very necessary to my evolution. And um, so why that name though? Was there because Camonche so means there's like, small, okay, yeah, yeah. and Camon is is a bigger body, it's okay. a lower tone, so I thought Camon would be a good name. I didn't want to call it Leila or you know, there, there all these <laughs> names. Imagine that, <laughs> you know, people come up with these names for their instruments that are building up. To me, it's very silly. Inst a name of an instrument has to suggest something of the nature of the instrument, <laughs> you know. It's a personal choice, but that was something that I felt, you know, if I'm going to name it, I'm going to name it something that means something. So what's nice is that, you know, what, what he's saying is it comes back to the exact things that we're talking about. It's a journey of self-discovery, you know, it's being able to, even if you are a musician who plays bass or guitar or drums, they are Western instruments, but there are ways to make that relevant to you as an Iranian. You don't have to play Western music on that. You don't have to play Persian classical music on that. But I think part of discovering what it means to you to be an Iranian American is something you can explore through your art, you know, and really create one thing that's guaranteed is we are all born with a unique voice and a unique, you know, there's a unique pattern to each of us. And there is no point in trying to be like anybody else. You can be inspired, but the moment you try to imitate others, it's the end of your success before you have even begun. So I really encourage people to just explore and explore until the, you find that your own unique voice. And the only way you're gonna find that is your self-discovery. What does it mean to you to have lived the life you live, to have come at the age you came from to a new country, to see the way your parents suffered or your brothers and sisters or your own unique experiences that nobody else will ever understand. Bring all of that into your language and what you have to say, you know. Boy, I think, um, are you just talking about the Iranian artists in diaspora, or are you talking because it's I would say both because, because it goes both ways. It goes both yeah. ways. Yeah. Culture. Because actually, the evolution of the neoclassical Iranian music is very different than the, the fusion. That's why I, I was just asked okay. that question. No, but you're getting too philosophical. It's actually for me a very simple answer. It's that I, I really feel that uh, since the beginning of time, and this is not just unique to Iranian culture. I think in the West, uh, as you can see, there are so many uh, legal battles over music rights and, fi and really um, fighting for the right of artists to earn more for the music that they create. Unfortunately, in the history of humanity, when you look at it, there has been very little value for music 
since the beginning, you know, even the, this cultural mindset of everybody wants music for free. In Iran, growing up, what happened? You went to someone's house and you heard a CD they liked, you were playing, you know, in Iran, copy con befrest, you know, it was copy the music and send it to me. You, people never like to pay for music, even though we cannot live without music, there is this thing that, you know, it doesn't have that much value. So when you believe that something doesn't have value, you treat it like it doesn't have value. So somebody writes a song and it's a hit, oh, you know, I'm gonna write a song just like that, you know, I'm just gonna copy that and it's gonna, it's a formula. I'm just gonna try to copy that. Whereas, you know, if there's a value for art, even you as an artist, out of self-respect, you would say, you know what, that's already been done, it's great, and I'm gonna try to do something different. You know, I can be inspired by that, but I'm gonna try to do something. So it's it boils down to partially for me about education, about music, because I don't think it, we just need to educate audiences about the value of music. I think a lot of times we have to educate artists about the value of music. I personally get very upset when people copy our ideas or I take it personally. He's very easy going about it. I say, oh, you know, look, they're doing this, they're doing that, and he laughs. But it always really bothers me because I feel that it's, it, it's, it's not that I'm afraid I will lose something. It's that I, f I feel it is a sign of disrespect for, for the labor I have put in to create something unique. You know, because that's what I take pride so in. You look at it so different. Because to me, is that when you leave this, you you come. Let's take it. Let's take it out of our context because it just doesn't happen in Iranians. Yeah. English. It happens in every genre. L let's look at the movie Matrix. It comes and leaves a mark. It kind of creates a a style and of film and videography that um, anything else now you keep comparing it to, or people want to try to recreate that partially out of inspiration, partially out of commercialism. And same thing happens in Iranian music now. Like, okay, different times people come and they create a certain new sound or standard. What happens first, it's an inspiration and then it's a, it's a desperation. They wanna make it, they wanna kind of grow in the market. So they start copying. That's basically happens. She gets upset. I feel like, you know what, I'm honored. You're trying to copy me. We left this, we left the mark. You know, we left already our mark, and that's that's to me is actually a affirmation of of originality to to our music. Okay, I'm not taking it out of our context. Now I'm asking the question. <laughs> yes, <laughs> now we're gonna end up in a show. <laughs> no, but really, to so maybe a different way to ask the question is so if you look at let's say Iranian pop music or even the sort of in what I don't even know how you would describe this genre Musiri Tanz. It's a, it's its Musi own genre. Yeah, I, what, what you, it, I don't know how you translate that. Have this music. No Musiri Tanz, the kind of this um, uh, form of a, of Iranian fusion music that is kind of taking little shape. Little bit rock, little bit jazz, Humorous, little bit. but it has a, all of them has a little bit of a humor feel to it. Satirical, it's okay. a bit satirical, yeah, but it's now a, it's its own genre, it's and there are like five billion Iranian bands a lot doing of that. The, very much influenced by Tom Waits, Leonard Cohen, kind of a, a beats and cabaret feel of the old days, that are taking it unconsciously or consciously, a little bit of tango. These that kind of are a little bit of has a little bit of a light humor to the music itself. Okay, not but just now there are like fifty bands yeah, doing the same there, thing. There are fifty yeah. pop bands doing the same. So why do you think that is that in our culture we just copy, 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 copy? As I said, because first somebody comes and does that, and then it becomes a, a it, it gets recognized. So he left. He created a standard in that whatever it is, doesn't matter if you and I like it, but he created that. People pay attention to it and then out of desperation, you know, first for inspiration because they got inspired by it, but then out of desperation they try to copy it. So it's always copy comes out of uh, inspiration and then desperation. That's, that's the way I look at it. Great. So what was the really important thing? Now, I want to go back yeah. to modernization. <laughs> 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 yeah. Because what happened is that the capitalism made 
created a synonym, um, uh, made the correlation between modernization and uh, westernization. How? By first making the, the other regions believe that modernization means consumption. So if you had a TV, if you have a car, if you were wearing this, and if you have that, then you are modernized. But that's actually consumption. It, that's where it began to go wrong. When we confuse modernization with consumption, you don't need to consume in order to be modernized. The modernization is the way you have changed the perception and the way you express and you function in the world. Julie, it's, it's very interesting. I, I will end it on this note because, you know, one of the things we do is we perform at a lot of universities and uh, we recently did a big tour and we're continuing where we do um, outreach programs with college students or the community, extended community. Sometimes it's with little kids, sometimes it's with uh, in very serious classes. So professors bring us in and we do workshops with the kids on, on different subjects depending on what the professor needs. And it's something we're very passionate about doing. And um, recently we were at a, at a college and this prof he was a professor of humanities and he invited us to speak for his cl at his class. And when he introduced us, he used a very unique word to introduce our music. And he said, it's, for me, their music is post-colonial. And that word really stayed with me, you know? And I didn't say anything. And later I wrote to him and I said, you know, I want to thank him for inviting us to his class. And I said, you know, he, he, that he, he, he was such an intelligent man. I said, I'm very curious to know why you uh, chose that particular word. And it really comes back to what we're talking about because it really is about, what we're talking about is not that we have an issue with, with identity in terms of being proud to be Iranian or that kind of nationalism. It's that we are very much against, globali against colonialization. So that's something that we constantly promote in, in our music. And it was very interesting for me that the professor referred to our music as post-colonial because he said, it, it makes me, your music makes me realize what it could be if Iranian or other ethnic, you know, other artists from other, you know, sort of cultures decided to create modern music, but it was still related to where they really come from. And I thought that was one of the most wonderful ways that anyone has ever described our music. 